Let's look at how you choose a sample size in order to set the margin of error for a confidence interval. So before a confidence interval can be built, uh, you needed a simple random sample, at least a random sample to be selected out of a population. But before you can do this, logically, you have to determine what size sample that you want to use. So in order to do that, you want to think about what's the level of confidence and what margin of error are going to be acceptable for the purposes of whatever study you're doing. So let's consider one last time the class bead bag. So in the previous lesson, we found a 90% confidence interval for the true proportion of red beads. And we found that interval to be here with this lower and this upper boundary based on a point estimate of 0.46. So I can use that point estimate and the confidence interval here to work backwards in a very simple way and figure out the margin of error. So our margin of error, I like to take the upper boundary of 0.575 in this case and subtract away the point estimate. Now remember, if you don't have the point estimate, it is absolutely in the dead center of these two values. So if you take these two values, the upper and lower boundary, if you average them, find their exact middle, you get the point estimate. So I suppose I didn't really have to give you this. We could have determined that. So, but if I take the upper boundary minus the point estimate, this will give me the margin of error. So from the point estimate, it will tell me how far up did I go to build that upper boundary? That would be the margin of error. So in this case, we'll take the upper boundary of 0.575 and we'll subtract our point estimate of 0.46. So that gives us a margin of error of 0.115. So that's, that's interpreted as 11.5%. So this is a relatively large margin of error. So let's say instead we'd rather have a margin of error of no more than 7.5%. Again, I'm just choosing that as an example. And let's say we're willing to sacrifice some accuracy. So let's say an 80% confidence level is acceptable. So in other words, when I, in, when I change my margin of error to 7.5%, that's going to require a larger sample size. So I'm going to balance that a little bit with lowering the level of confidence. That will lower the critical value, and that will give me a slightly narrower interval. Uh, the only reason I'm doing that in this example is just to, uh, is just to keep the numbers relatively small. Plus, it's good to practice how do you find the confidence level. So our job then is to decide what sample size would be needed to achieve these goals. So there's the margin of error that's desired, and here's my level of confidence. So understand, we already have taken a sample from this population. So for our best guess for the parameter, we can simply use the 0.46 that we've already seen previously. That's the point estimate from the last example. So we can look at the formula for the margin of error, and we can substitute this value for the point, rather for the point estimate, we can substitute the value of 0.46. And then we can also substitute in the 7.5% for the margin of error, but you need to be careful that needs to go in as a decimal. So notice the way I've written this. The margin of error is equal to this formula. Now I have not written it as inequality. I'll show you why in a second. But typically the margin of error would be plus or minus the critical value times the standard error. Well, I've changed it though to this greater than or equal to. So the idea being this is no longer the margin of error. We're going to call this the desired. So this is the desired margin of error. So I want that 7.5 to be right here because I want 7.5 to percent to be greater than or equal to the real margin of error that we calculate. So we want our real margin of error to be less than or equal to 7.5%. That's our desired margin of error. I don't want to exceed that. So that 7.5% goes in as a decimal. 0.075, greater than or equal to plus or minus, we need to find our critical value. 
So there's the 0.46 that goes in for p hat and 1 minus p hat. There's the sample size that we're going to solve for. But before we can continue, we need the critical value. So we want the critical value for 80% confidence. So again, let me draw a picture of what this represents. So for practical purposes, we can think about this as we want to find the z-scores. So that we are finding the boundaries for the middle 80% of the distribution. So in order to do that, we have cut off a total of 20% of the distribution. That gives you 10% in each tail that we have cut off. So remember the inverse norm command, the input to that, the input to that is a percentile. So the easiest thing to do is right here to put in this point 0.1, and that will give us this boundary right here, in this case for the upper 10th percentile, and that will be the boundary that we need in order to find our critical value. So we're going to do inverse norm point 0.1, second variables, inverse norm command, point 0.1, So that gives us negative 1.28. So what that tells me is between Z scores of negative and positive 1.28 in an approximately normal distribution, I get about 80% of my data. So that 1.28 is the critical value that we want to use. So I can put that in here. And now I have everything that I need in order to solve for my sample size, that's what I'm looking for. So this inequality up here can be solved for n to find that required sample size. So the first thing I'm going to do is divide both sides of this inequality by 1.28. So if I do that, my desired margin of error will now be over the critical value of 1.28. The 1.28 will be gone then from the right side, so all I will have left is the plus or minus and the radical. And the reason I wanted to do that, to isolate the radical, now I can square both sides to eliminate the radical and the plus and minus. So if I square both sides, on the right side I have my desired margin of error divided by the critical value, that is squared, that needs to be greater than or equal to. Here the square and the radical will undo one another. So I have my 0.46 and 1 minus 0.46. That's the 0.54 and that's all divided by n. And now we can solve for n. So if I multiply both sides of this expression by n, then to get the n by itself, all I need to do is divide both sides of the expression by this squared quantity right here. So n needs to be greater than or equal to the 0.46 times the 0.54. And then that expression is divided by this squared quantity. This squared quantity is made up of the desired margin of error divided by the critical value for the level of confidence that I want. So literally this expression is all I need to evaluate and then I will have my sample size to achieve my desired margin of error at that level of confidence, at the 80% confidence level. So I'll take the 0.46 times the 0.54 and then I'm going to divide by this squared quantity that was the desired margin of error divided by the critical value of 1.28. Oops. Close the parentheses there. Then I can square it. There we go. So notice I get a sample size of 72.4, we'll call it. Now, it's important to always round up you need that 0.4 of an observation to guarantee your desired margin of error at this level of confidence. 
So to guarantee the desired margin of error, you always round the sample size up. Yes, I know that the typical way of rounding would take 72.4 and round it down to 72. But that 0.4 of an observation is needed to guarantee my margin of error. So when we're working with a sample size to establish a margin of error, you always round up. So here our answer would be a sample size of 73. So take a look. Let's continue with this example just briefly here. So let's notice that in this example, we had a guess for the truth, 0.46. So let's say that you're building a brand new confidence interval for a brand new uh, parameter and you don't know what that parameter will be. So if you don't have a guess that exists, the best way to find your sample size to guarantee your margin of error is to use a sample proportion, an estimate, a point estimate for the parameter of 0.5. So notice here's the same desired margin of error. Here is the critical value for 80% confidence. So instead, let's use 0.5. So this would be 1 minus 0.5. That's also 0.5 if we simplify that. So rather than going through all of the algebra again, what I want you to see is that there's a basic strategy in the way that we solved this expression. So notice, here's my guess for the truth. Here's 1 minus that guess. And then in the denominator, to find that sample size, it's just the desired margin of error divided by my critical value, and that expression is squared. So rather than going through all the algebra to manipulate this, I'm going to immediately go to the expression that I know will work. Here is my 0.5 times my 0.5. Here's the desired margin of error over the critical value, and that expression is squared, and this will give me my desired sample size. So here we go, I'll do the same thing, 0.5 times 0.5. And now we're gonna divide by that same expression. So the desired margin of error is 7.5%. And then I will divide by my critical value of 1.28. We have to square that. And there we go. So this time we get a sample size of 72.8. So again, rounding up, that would take us to a sample size, once again, of 73. Now notice, we got essentially the same answer. We got essentially the same answer. Well, understand, the result didn't change because notice that our original guess of 0.46 times 0.54 that numerator that we used previously is very similar to the numerator of 0.5 times 0.5. Those are very close in value. The truth is though, that's not always the case. So when you are building a confidence interval, if you have a legitimate guess for what you think the population parameter might be, like our 0.46, it's perfectly okay to use that to find your sample size. But if you're not sure about that value, if you really don't have a best guess, the best thing to do is to use 0.5. The reason that using 0.5 is a good idea is because that makes this numerator as large as possible. By making this numerator as large as possible, what that does is it makes the standard error as large as possible for a given size of a sample. So what that does is it essentially makes your sample size, if you will, quote, overly large um, in order to guarantee that margin of error. So no matter what your actual parameter, rather, no matter what your actual point estimate may be, the sample size will still be large enough in order to guarantee you that margin of error. So let me show you an example of this. So example one, let's say a student claims that over 70% of WHS students use iOS phones. So you want to construct a 95% confidence interval to assess this claim. In other words, to decide if this 70% is even plausible or not. And you'd like a margin of error of no more than 8.25%. Again, I just made up that 8.25% to give us um, a different type of decimal in order to put in for our desired margin of error. 
So this is the level of confidence we want to use. This is the margin of error that we would like to establish. So again, here's the strategy. We'll put on our best guess and one minus our best guess for the truth. And then we'll divide by the desired margin of error over the critical value that we need and we'll square that. So now I would hope that you have this memorized. For 95%, the desired critical value is 1.96. So our margin of error then we should put in as a decimal. So let's say that we go ahead and use this claim of 0.7 as our best guess for the truth. Okay, well, let's take that 0.7. 1 minus 0.7 will be 0.3. And then I will divide by my desired margin of error as a decimal. So be careful, that's 0 0.0825. And I will divide by my critical value. I wrote 1.98 up there. What I should have written is 1.96. That's the critical value for 95% confidence. And then this expression has to be squared. So let's simplify this and see what kind of a sample size that we get. So the 0.7 times the 0.3, we'll divide that by the square of our desired margin of error, 0 0.0825. We'll divide that by the critical value of 1.96. So this gives us a sample size of 118.5. So if we round that up, we need to go to 119. So, but understand, I did this calculation under the assumption that 70% is a reasonable guess for the real population parameter. It may be that the, the student's claim is really far off from the truth. If that's the case, it would be better. It would be better to use 0.5 as our guess for the truth. Let me show you why. So if we do exi exactly the same calculation, but instead of using the claimed value as our best guess, let's use 0.5. So 0.5, 1 minus 0.5 is also 0.5. So our desired margin of error is 0.825. And then we will divide by 1.96 and square it. What I want you to see is we get quite a bit different of a sample size. So we're basically repeating exactly the same process again. So here's the 0.0825. There's my desired margin of error. We'll divide by the critical value for 95% confidence. That's 1.96. So notice, we get a much larger sample size here. It's 141.1. So we should not round this down. This should be rounded up to 142. So notice... A decision then has to be made before you collect your data. You have to decide, do you want to try to get a sample size of 119 or 142? Look, 142 is going to be more work, but if you want to guarantee your margin of error, if that margin of error and, and hitting this mark, if that is something that's important to you, you should go with the larger sample size. It's better to have a sample size that's too big this might result in a lower margin of error. Well, that's a good thing because you're tending to be closer to the truth. So once the sample is taken, if the parameter is not as extreme as it was expected to be, the goal of achieving that margin of error could be compromised. So let me show you. So let me show you the margins of error that you get if you use a sample size of 119 versus 142. So Example 2a, so let's say you choose to use that 119 to assess this claim. So in your simple random sample, let's say 67 students have an iOS phone, so what's the margin of error? Okay, well notice the parameter isn't as, rather the point estimate isn't as extreme as the claim. So 67 divided by 119, 
that's only 56%. The claim was 70%. Uh, this is lower than that. So we're getting a P hat of 56%. And the reason that I needed that was for my margin of error. So notice the margin of error is just plus or minus the critical value, which was 1.96. So then we should divide by the standard error. The standard error here, we use the P hat, which was 0.56. Then 1 minus 0.56, that would be 0.44. And then we should divide by our sample size of 119. So, but notice we went with the smaller sample size here. Notice what's happened. So if we take then the 1.96, let's multiply by the square root of then our standard error. That's the 0.56 times 0.44 divided by the smaller sample size of 119, take a look at what's happened. So in this case, the margin of error that we got is 0 0.089. So notice what's happened. So our margin of error is 0 0.089. So that's 8.9%. Using the smaller sample size, we didn't achieve our margin of error of 8.25%. This is too large. So we missed our goal. And if that goal was important, we should have stuck with the bigger sample size. So notice that's what example 2B is about. So let's say instead you choose to use the sample size of 142 and you're assessing that same claim. So in your simple random sample, let's say 80 students have an iOS phone. Now what's the margin of error? Well, take a look. I rigged it. So if you go back, 80, this time out of the larger sample size of 142, notice, to be fair, I'm using as close as I can get to the same point estimate of 0.563-ish. So we can use 0.56 again in order to build our margin of error. So our margin of error still uses a critical value of 1.96. So now the standard error of the statistic is 0.56 times 0.44 again, just like before, but this time I'm dividing by the larger sample size of 142. So now we get to see if we've met our goal. So 1.96 times the standard error of the statistic. So that would be 0.56 times 0.44. Divide by the sample size of 142. And that gives us a margin of error of 0.0816. So notice this time we did meet our goal. Our margin of error, practically speaking here is 8.16%. We wanted a margin of error that was no more than 8.25%. So we accomplished that by using the larger sample size. So bottom line, if you have a credible, a thoughtful best guess for what you think the uh, population parameter might be, you are welcome to use that in your numerator in order to use your best guess for the parameters. Um, if you do not have a thoughtful guess, the truth is you're better off using 0.5. Then you can use your desired uh, margin of error and then the critical value that you need for your level of confidence to establish the sample size that you need to meet those goals. But remember, with our sample size, we always round up.